so we're looking at Milton's uh, paired poems, L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, which are uh, unique in English literature. Um, when I say they're unique, the idea of pairing opposites is not unique, um, nor is the approach to character study per se. So there, among the classical writers, there's somebody named Theophrastes who's interested in character. And this becomes uh, of great interest in this period in which Milton's writing character. Um, Shaftesbury, Lord Shaftesbury writes characteristics of great men and so forth. And, and you, can e you can even see the, it's not opposites, but parallel. So Plutarch writes parallel lives. And so he looks at Julius Caesar alongside of, uh, who does he see, alongside Alexander the Great and so forth. So he takes various figures from Greek and Roman history and pairs them up. But those aren't contrasts, those are parallels. The, the contrast in parallel, uh, or the parallel in terms of contrast is uh, arising in this period largely. But interesting character. Uh, character, literally the word character, refers to a stamp on something. Um, um, and in, like a, think of a, the old printing press where it actually leaves a physical impression in the paper, like an old typewriter, which you may not have seen. I learned typing in school before they went, became obsolete technology, but you push the key and then it would hit the paper and leave a, you know, ink impression, but it was actually a physical key. And if you looked on the back side, you could see that it had put, hit the paper and made an impression. You could see it on the back. And that's what character is. It's a fixed um, impression. Um, so it's, a, it's then characteristic of somebody. They act in a certain way and then if they don't act in accordance with that, you'll say they're, they acted out of character because you expect it to be fixed. So you, and everyone acts out of character occasionally. But in the theater, um, it doesn't work very well when people act out of character because you need strong character types to create the sort of interplay of, um, of opposites, which I think is the principle of art, uh, poetry and otherwise. You, you repeat the same things. It's in biblical poetry as well. You do say the same thing twice. You're effectively emphasizing or you can contradict. Say one thing, say it again. Say it a third time. Or you can say one thing and then you can contradict what you just said. And the apparent contradiction which exists on one level may be uh, opening up that there's a deeper way in which the original statement needs to be understood. And Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount addresses this, this when he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You're not to commit adultery, but I say to you, if any man even looks at a woman um, the wrong way, he's committed adultery, right? So there's, ah, so there's the formal adultery, which it, everyone understands, and the Pharisees are ready to throw stones because they, the, the law has been breached. But yes, it goes, but it's, it's a deeper problem than that. It's, it's not just external, but internal. And so the whole emphasis of New Testament teaching is that there is, um, that the law can be broken not only through your deeds but, and, and your words, but even through your thoughts. In which case, there's no escape from the problem of sin. And you need to be born again. You need a new heart and a new soul and a new person. You literally need to be born again. But that, again, comes through this contrast, the juxtaposition, and that's part of the pedagogy here. Milton's L'Allegro in Il Penseroso, as I say, belong among the, his early minor poems. They fall between the Nativity Ode, which we've already looked at, and Lysidas, which we are going to look at. And... Um, I think they're among his uh, great poems, which is why we're looking at it. 
and uh, they deal to some degree with uh, his sense of vocation, which he's developing in his early 20s. And in his case, he believes that God has been called to be a poet that will serve God by writing poetry. That's what his very strong sense of vocation is very early on. Or to put it in his words, quote, to breed and cherish in a great nation the seeds of virtue and public civility. Isn't that interesting as a poetic vocation? He's there to breed and to cherish in a great nation the seeds of virtue and public civility. So he's an educator. He's to teach and to delight. That's the purpose of being a great poet. Before, we, before I started recording, we are just talking about literature. People want to be great writers or even good writers. What do they really want? Do they want attention? Do they want money? Do they want success? Or do they recognize that there is a, a duty laid upon writers, at least in uh, Milton's perspective, but not only his, that of the classical tradition of inculcating virtue in the audience. And in fact, that's what writers do. They either promote virtue or they promote its opposite. And they're culpable for it. So I remember I, we talked about Comus and the theater and the scandal of Queen Henrietta appearing on stage and the concerns surrounding the theater and its effect on morality. And I talked about one of the contexts being that the theater was full of prostitutes and all sorts of problems. And so the, some in the Puritans camp wanted to shut the theaters down, not only because of what was being depicted on stage, but because of the whole effect of theaters in promoting vice, etc. So let's just shut it all down. Mount Milton's not with them. He thinks that art serves a function. Just because it's often used badly doesn't mean that it can't be used well. In fact, he thinks it must be used well, and it's essential. That's what we looked at in uh, Areopagitica. He, he strongly promotes the importance of publication, of public virtue, not just private, but public. But still, the, uh, he is there to breed and cherish seeds of virtue and public civility. That's what the writer needs to do. That's what the artist needs to do. It's a duty. He has to have that character himself then. He's very firm on this idea as well. You can't promote in others what you don't have yourself. So he's austere in his habits, as I say, uh, his university friends calls him Our Lady from Christ Church because of the hair, but also maybe just the, he's not acting like young men do of his age, being vulgar and drinking and who knows what, but is uh, mindful of, it, of his duties. Um, but we'll, but in these poems, I said to you what he talks about in Comus, the way in which virtue personified in the lady there in the midst of the forest is assailed by Comus, misrule, uh, sin to some degree, chaos, is able to stand in the midst of that. He's exploring those tensions in his early years. And as I said, I get the sense that he is using all sorts of poetic forms to build himself up to write the great epic poem he knows he is, has been called to write, but he's not ready yet. Even though he knows that he is this great writer, he, as I say, he's not lacking in self-confidence, He part of his ability there is to judge his own readiness for that, and he doesn't think he's ready. But here is in, in L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, he'll be looking at uh, contradictory notions of, of the self. On the one hand, we will have the, uh, the cheerful uh, L'Allegro, the cheerful, the bright, the lively. And on the other hand, we will have the melancholic, brooding, contemplative type. And uh, I've 
when I've lectured on this before, I've said that there's a whole tradition here of seeing these two as the only respectable forms of, li of living, uh, going back as far as the Greeks. Now, when I say this, there is in the uh, Greco and Roman world, uh, a merchant class who um, produce goods, who uh, market goods, who make money, etc. The, the, the philosophers and the politicians by and large um, express contempt for that way of living, which is just enriching oneself because you're not really acting any differently than the animals do at that point because all they are concerned with is bodily maintenance as well. You may be getting more food, you may be getting better food, you may, but these are really not worthy hum, human tasks. The, the distinctively human tasks Im, involve the employment of our reasoning, our rational faculties. And you can do that through two means. You can do it through politics or the active life. In Greek, the uh, bios politikos. I don't think I have my whiteboard marker here. Give me a sec, I'll pull it over. So that's one form of life. The other is, again, Greek and Latin, the bios or bios theoreticos. And the counterpart to the vita, uh, to the, uh, that in, in Latin is the vita contemplativa. One is more worldly-minded, the political life, the active life. That's the worldly-minded. It, it, it's practical affairs. It's know-how in the ways of men, how to interact with one another, how to achieve an outcome, how to mobilize people in the political or public realm to do good things. That's a legitimate form of life. It's worthy. That's what all of the Greeks recognize, the whole polis is there to promote the, bio, the bios politicos. That's what it's there for. It's where f men who are freed from the necessity to labor, they've got land, they've got slaves that support them, go on and do the political life. And that means deliberation in council, uh, using wisdom, prudential judgment, and deciding what we as a city are going to do now. Are we going to go to war? Are we going to act in peace? Are we going to send out a, a fleet to uh, enrich the city, etc. That's, that's a legitimate human way of living. The other is invented by Socrates. He says that there is something that's superior ten to that life, and that's the life of the philosopher. So this is the politician, this is the philosopher, the theoretical life, which quickly translates in Christian theology to, from the uh, philosopher to perhaps the theologian even. It doesn't go away, however, these two forms of life. And this one is also going to have certain associations with it, the political life, the active life, and it's primarily people who are cheerful in disposition. Lively, spirited, very busy. Today, the, the people that are like that get sucked into the business world because they have, they have energy and etc. Right? And, and they have an attractiveness about them. They're able to persuade others. Uh, in the ancient Greek world, not so. They get pulled into the political life and they didn't want to be out of the political life. That's where you want to be if you are that sort. Whereas here, in this sort of life, it's more what we would call introverted, melancholic, a certain 
we associate now psychological types that go with that. And Milton, it's not that he doesn't touch on those, but the ideas of psychological profiles and et cetera is, is uh, anachronistic here. They don't have those terms, but they are describing something of that type of thing. And Milton pairs them here in these two poems as, as opposed to one another, uh, hostile to one another. And, and in this, he probably is observing uh, what the ancient Greeks themselves observe and which gets passed on in medieval Europe into the just the way in which uh, Christianity is absorbed into the uh, aristocracy. Now, let me give you an example of how this works. In uh, the case of Martin Luther, Luther had a brother. He was born of a very wealthy merchant. Right? And, his, and his father wanted him to be a lawyer. Why a lawyer? Because then the lawyer would lead to the political life. He could be a, a part of the court of, of a prince or a king, and he would do worthy things in that realm. So he'd be, become a lawyer and thereby a politician. But on the road uh, and to, uh, I don't know where he was off to, but then that famous lightning storm, he was struck down, and he decided to become a monk. He was the firstborn son, though. The firstborn son inherits the father's wealth. Always, right? Or at least a double portion. There's some sort of uh, the family name and the family wealth goes with the first son. He has to do what dad has done. His father, who's a merchant, wants him to be worldly and act, you know, well. But yes, in this, do something practical, Martin. And Martin Luther decides at that point where he's struck down, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna become a monk. His father's furious because his whole family fortune is now going down this route. It's gonna be lost to the church. This is what uh, everyone with wealth and privilege in their day wants. They'll put their second born son in the monastery, but the first born has to go into the active life. Shakespeare plays on this over and over in his plays as well. There's a, there's a and, and, and the need for a balancing there. So if you are a political ruler as well, now, and this is the product of the Reformation as well, you need to be a Renaissance man, you need to be a both. You need to be a philosopher king. That's the ideal. You need to be theologically minded, but you need to be practically useful, and you need to be, you, know, you need to get your hands dirty. Philosophers don't want to deal with the problems of life. And they're largely a bit of a caricature, but mostly true. They're not very good at that either. They don't know how to deal with people. They don't want to deal with those sorts of problems. But boy, can they talk in abstraction and think about and contemplate about things that are very important. They just can't then bring it there. Whereas these types of people want to get on with action. They want to do it, but they tend not to think about the long-term consequences, etc. So the ideal is a marriage of the two, and the Renaissance strongly promotes that. Right? That is the Renaissance man. And when I say the Renaissance man, it's not only the Renaissance man, Elizabeth I was schooled in theology, read Greek and Latin, corresponded it in multiple languages and so forth. So she was a Renaissance woman, and yet she was a queen and knew how to act and when to act, etc. But that's the ideal. So was her father, Henry VIII, by the way. It's, it's really the ideal of the age. Interesting, huh? And, but this idea of the active life and the contemplative life and one being more active and the other being more passive, the one being more cheerful and the other being more morose, melancholic, tending to um, what we call depression, um, that's observed here. And Milton juxtaposes them as contrast to one another. And some see this as Milton's own recognition of sides of himself being in contradiction. So it's the poet's own psyche uh, dealing with that. And that gets played out by other poets. Yeats talks about it. Uh, so does Blake, if you know Blake at all. Um, remember his, uh, his most famous works, uh, which are the... Um, you know, those, those contrasting poems, I just, I cannot, the songs of innocence and experience. It's a framing of this in different, and they're meant, and, and he, as he identifies them, meant to be the contrasting parts of the human soul. 
That's how he frames it. But he frames it not in terms of action and contemplation, but of innocence and experience. Note the romantic spin on this then. One is associated with innocence. Well, what's that? The pastoral life, the green life. What's associated with experience? Well, it's the active life, the political life. But he, he, there's, a, there's a distortion there or a framing in it, and it has a different trajectory as a result. Milton's not doing that. He's writing earlier than that. Uh, if you want another approach that's like that, Andrew Marvell uh, does the same thing. Dialogue between soul and body. I, I dealt with that in 17th century literature um, where, they're, where they're at war with one another. That's more of a traditional framing of it. The soul has certain inclinations, the body has its inclinations. They each are at war to some degree with one another. It's could be seen Gnostically. I don't think it's necessarily so. So there are two different personas speaking here in the poem. So I think I can get rid of this now. I just wanted to give you a sense of the crash in which the tradition um, could be seen here and also just the the contrast. So Milton is thinking about this in terms of, of, of conflict and what's the right resolution for the conflict and which one of them is, is he going to privilege? Now you, you would think, given the fact that he is a contemplative poet, that he would favor Il Penseroso. Not so. And, and if you've looked at his treatise of education, and this was my emphasis last time, you would expect, given his John Milton, given the vast erudition that he possesses, that he's going to, it's going to be a heavily academic curriculum. And, and at first blush, it looks like that until you see, well, actually, he's saying that the kids 12 to 21 uh, should be learning agriculture and practical utility alongside their studies in the obviously ac more academic pursuits. So he is balancing that in his education. He thinks that it's important. So it's, it's not either or, it's both and. But they're speaking here as opposites and that I think is interesting here. So let me read this and just note here that the beginning of each uh, is, is more or less the same. So here, hence, I, I should put Il Penseroso up here so I can just flip back and forth. <coughs> Pardon me. There it is. <coughs> oh, there it is. L'Allegro, hence, loathed melancholy. Il penseroso, hence vain deluding joy. So it's not just that they're opposite perspectives, they're contrary perspective and they, there's a, a sense of antipathy between them. <coughs> and that then gets teased out in all the associations, but they begin with the same, be gone, get away from me, hence. I'll deal with them in order. I'll just go through the whole poem rather than flip back and forth. But note how they begin uh, from the same point of view of seeking to banish the other from, its, from their sight. So hence, loathed melancholy of Cerberus and blackest midnight born, in Stygian cave forlorn, midst horrid shapes and shrieks and sights unholy, find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads his jealous wings, and the night raven sings. There, under ebon shades and low-browed rocks, as ragged as thy locks, in dark Sumerian desert ever dwell. Okay, I'll, I'll just leave it at that first uh, 10 lines. Uh, what we see here <coughs> in the, these first 10 lines is a, a whole string of associations. So, so first of all, let's look at the... Uh, the complex rhyme scheme here. Melancholy, born, forlorn, holy. It's A, B, B, A, C, D, D, E, E, C, with alternating rhyme lengths as well. So it is a 10 line um, stanza 
which is not separated in terms of stanza. A 10 line structure. There is a slowness in the first line and then a uh, second shorter line throughout there. And you can see that, or the other way around. It begins short, then it goes long, then it goes short and long. So there's this alternation back and forth. And the, the sense of slowness and then speeding up and then slowing down and speeding up and slowing down and speeding up over and over and over and over again. And again, held together through some sort of uh, this complex rhyme scheme, uh, which he probably gets from Spencer. Edmund Spencer, his uh, poem Epithalamian on marriage. And with this, a, a sense of enchantment. This is what the critics have noted about both poems. In both, there seems to be a sort of a magical, incant incantatory, enchanting effect of the poetic line. And the associations are, uh, are pretty clear as well. Uh, with darkness, for one thing, and uh, along with uh, darkness, that is the associations from the perspective of L'Allegro, because he's adopting the persona of L'Allegro, by the way. I, I, I neglected to mention that. So he's putting on a mask. A persona refers to a mask. You're speaking through the mask. The mask, now let me put the mask of L'Allegro on. And then in the second poem, let me put the mask of Il Pensero, so I'll look at it from the vantage point of that character which I'm effectively playing or performing. And this will resonate throughout the poem because we're going to see that L'Allegro is associated with comedy and Il Penseroso is associated with tragedy. In both cases, in the Greek theatre and in the Roman theatre, the, the, the uh, actors wear masks. You can't see their faces. Remember the stage, they, they're in these vast amphitheaters and you cannot see the faces on the screen. It's not like a movie or television where you can focus in on the visual expressions. It's, it's done through uh, your vocal expression and your, and your bodily movement, but you can't see the face. And that's probably appropriate because again, the actors are, are male actors. People are always, are, sort of astonished by that. And that may have something to do with the perception of the theater, even in the ancient world, that it's corrosive and women are, uh, we don't want them to be associated with the crudity of the theaters. But you're wearing a mask, so it doesn't particularly matter. The mask is a means of amplification, by the way. So you can hear projection, right, even here. And I, you know, if people do this, it's what a loudspeaker does, it amplifies the voice, so does the mask but it also gives a fixed expression which doesn't change. So the mask of the tragic actor is even before the tragedy strikes, you can see the character being depicted in the, the way the mask looks. That is the fixed character, even if he does not yet realize, Oedipus, I'm thinking here, that he's about to be, uh, to suffer unimaginable horror. We can see that by his mask even before then, even when he's pronouncing, he's cheerful, the audience knows this is the man who is going to suffer terribly. Likewise, the comic actor will be always cheerful even in the midst of impending gloom and doom. You know that good is coming there. So there's a fixity about this, even in the midst of its opposite. So they're playing with this idea here. Uh, so it begins with this, as I say, the attempt to drive off its opposite. And he mentions a few things. Melancholy, a monster born in the underworld by the river Styx, according to Greek mythology. Later associated with a certain character type, right? Me to be melancholy, or, or even um, in 17th century psychology, associated with uh, a certain temperament. And associated furthermore with its relation to the constellation of the planets. You're born under certain stars, 
and that will have effect on your what we call your personality type. Everything's aligned, it's not accidental. But melancholy is born in the underworld by the river Styx, and in, uh, uh, this is from Hesiod, by the way, not Homer. Um, and the, only in that realm is his true name in genealogy uh, known. How is he conceived? Well, Milton um, alerts us to this by Cerberus. Cerberus, you'll know from even Harry Potter, the hellhound, three heads. And uh, copulating with a personified form of midnight. Melan so melancholy was once born in hell to a terrible beast along with midnight associated with all those sorts of things horror ugliness darkness hell coming to earth and now in the in a form that's threatening the lively cheerfulness of the cheerful man what do cheerful men want to have to do with gloom doom and gloom types Go away, spoiled sport, you're no fun. <clears throat> Find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads as jealous wings and the night raven sings there under ebon shades and low-browed rocks as ragged as thy locks in dark Sumerian desert ever dwell. So off you go, go there. But come, that also will be characteristic of Il Penseroso, so I don't have to say it in the next time. But hail thou goddess sage and holy, thou divinest melancholy. But come, thou God is fair and free. You go away, you come here. And in, in both cases, an invocation of a God or goddess to the, to the side of the speaker. <clears throat> um, but an appeal there uh, outside of his own uh, context to something higher, as I say, incantatory, enchanted, but come thou goddess, fair and free in heaven, eclept euphrosune. I learned it in Greek, so I can't remember, in German rather, so I can't remember how to pronounce it in English, never mind. <coughs> the eclept is an old Anglo Saxon vestige, called is what that means, eclept called this in heaven and by men heart easing mirth whom lovely venus at a birth with two sister graces more to ivy crowned bacchus bore so associations with mirth cheerfulness uh, scriptures say that the wine maketh the heart glad all sorts of associations there in, in biblical writing in uh, classical writing Bacchus, remember the wine god, also the god of poetry. Also, there's negative associations with Bacchus. Obviously, in L'Allegro, no, it's all good, because I'm promoting my ca case. It's almost the English tradition being expressed in this, where you get in the House of Parliament, you get two sides, you get the government, and then you get the, the opposition. The, the role of the opposition is to, is to disagree with the government, and the idea is that together, a, a better outcome will be envisaged than one party's perspective. That's how parliament is supposed to work, through opposition. Not just one party getting its way, but through, through the opposition of debate and a, an awareness that there are two sides to every argument and actually there might be a better deliberation and outcome from this than the one party envisaged just because it had the power. That's how parliament is supposed to work. So you don't dispense with the parliamentary mechanisms. That's what the courts of law are there for as well. The antagonism, you get the prosecution, you get the defense. The truth comes out in all of that and then we can do something better than merely prosecute our enemies politically and otherwise. Um, so Milton is uh, playing on this here. But she was born to Ivy Chrome Bacchus or whether, and this is another way of looking at it, where uh, mirth came from, or whether as some sager sang the frolic wind which breath that breathes the, s the spring, Zephyr with Aurora playing as he met her once a May. 
there on beds of violets blue and fresh blown roses washed in dew. Filled her with thee, a daughter fair, so buxom blithe and debonair. <coughs> a different way of conceiving of the origin of mirth. Very much like what he will do in Paradise Lost. Very much like what we see characteristic of uh, Ovid in his metamorphosis. Unclear what the origin is. Let me give you all the possibilities and I'll just list them. But all the associations with this, we recognize there's something there, where it comes from, etc. But let me list all that. It adds a richness and texture to this. And then he'll say, haste the nymph. I want you to note that in Il Penseroso, he'll go through the same thing. So there's a clear structure of parallelism that exists throughout both poems, top to bottom. One is speaking, the other is speaking from the other side. Haste the nymph and bring with thee jest and youthful jollity, quips and cranks and wanton wiles, nods and becks and wreathed smiles, such as hang on Hebe's cheek and love to live in dimple sleek. Sport that wrinkled care derides and laughter holding both his sides. Come and trip it as ye go on the light fantastic toe and in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph sweet liberty and if i give thee honor due mirth admit me of thy crew to live with her and live with thee in unreproved pleasures free now you know like from the beginning he begins with the long and the short line the short and the long now we find a uh, he's found his rhythm and he's going to stick with it iambic tetrameter <clears throat> more or less uh, not consistent but more or less but we have the same line length and now and and the, and the rhyming couplets then Milton will uh, show disdain for rhyming couplets when he comes to write his epic so he says that no uh, epic writer has ever been chained to rhyme except a barbaric age such as our own I'm not going to be you can do what you like. I will not be forced to write rhyming couplets just because it's the product of my age. This is barbaric. If our age is this, then it's barbaric. I will hold to the Greeks and the Romans on this in their, in their epic poems. But that doesn't mean that he disdains rhyming couplets at all. Here he thinks it's appropriate. <clears throat> Again, mastering the form. And it, why would a rhyming couplet be appropriate? Well, because of its, its strong parallelism, the, the dualism that is incumbent upon even the sound of rhyme. Here saying the same thing over and over from different vantage points. To hear the lark begin his flight and singing, startle the dull night and from his watch tower in the skies till the dappled dawn doth rise then to come in spite of sorrow and at my window bid good morrow through the swipe the sweet briar or the vine or the twisted eglantine while the cock with lively din scatters the rear of darkness thin and to the stack or the barn door stoutly struts his dames before off listening how the hounds and horn cheerly rouse the slumbering morn from the side of some hoar hill through the high wood echoing shrill sometime walking not unseen by hedgerow elms or hillocks green right against the eastern gate where the great sun begins his state robed in flames and amber light the clouds in thousand liveries dight while the plowman near at hand whistles o'er the furrowed land and the milkmaid beginneth blithe and the mower wets his scythe and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale landscape now associated with this it's the bucolic landscape of the uh, of the eclogue. It is a paradisal association. It's the life of cheerfulness, of the celebration of the goodness of the earth, the context for love poetry, 
which we saw it last semester in the uh, biblical literature when Song of Songs was there, uh, written by a shepherd to a shepherdess falling in love, yes, but the writer is Solomon, who never served as shepherd in a field, and yet he would call himself a shepherd and associate his task as a king with being a good shepherd, just like his father David did. When he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, etc. So the idea of the king as a shepherd, so it's a political ideal being uh, exhibited in the rustic life of nature and all of the goodness there. Cheerful, happy, full of love, full of life, and simple at that. These are the, this is the backdrop for L'Allegro here as well. And again, to this very day, <coughs> uh, when we have associations of, uh, of paradise, they are the simple associations like this. It's the ideal state where you can live in the presence of a natural order which is no longer fallen and no, full of no contradictions, just bright, cheerful, etc. <clears throat> Straight mine eye hath caught new pleasures whilst the landscape round it measures russet lawns and fallows gray where the nibbling flocks do stray, mountains on whose barren breast the laboring clouds do often rest, meadows trim with davy, daisies pied, shallow brooks and rivers wide, towers and battlements at seas bosomed high in tufted trees, where perhaps some beauty lies, the cynosure of neighboring eyes, hard by a cottage chimney smokes from betwixt two aged oaks, where Corydon and Thyrsus met are at their savory dinner set of herbs and other country messes, which the neat-handed Phyllis dresses. Now these names here, Phyllis and Coridon and Thyrsus, uh, are commonplace names associated with, again, um, country poetry, regular in 16th and 17th century literature. These sort of stock names. <coughs> At any rate, uh, and then in her haste, her bower she leaves with Thestilus to bind the sheaves. Or if the earlier season led to the tanned haycock in the mead, sometimes with secure delight, the upland hamlets will invite when the merry bells ring round and the jocund rebecks sound to many a youth and many a maid dancing in the checkered shade. And young and old come forth to play on a sunshine holy day. Till the live long daylight fail, then to the spicy nut brown ale. Okay, so the cheerful dancing in the daylight, and then they're going to continue it with a few rounds of ale. The celebrations continue in the pub. With stories told of many a feat, how fairy mab the junkets eat. Fairy Mab, a uh, reference uh, to, the, uh, to British mythology here. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and, and so forth, uh, context here. She was pinched and pulled, she said, and he by Friar's lanthorn let, tells how the grudging goblin sweet sweat to earn his cream bowl duly set. When in one night, ere glimpse of morn, His shadowy flail hath threshed the corn, that ten day labors could not end. Then lies him down the lubber fend, and stretched out all the chimney's length, basks at the fire his hairy strength, and crop full of out of doors he flings, ere the first cock his matin rings. Thus dawn the tales, to bed they creep, by whispering winds, soon lulled asleep. So that's the end of the day. They go to sleep after a joyous day of celebration and, uh, and rejoicing. It's a picture of um, the coming of the kingdom of God often. The, the, the same sort of associations. Wine, cheerfulness, celebration, dancing, rural life, 
that's how it's portrayed even in scripture, those same associations, those are stock associations of that sort of thing. <clears throat> so then it moves into a different, uh, in a different direction here. Towered cities please us then, and the busy hum of men, where throngs of knights and barons bold in weeds of peace, weeds are clothes, high triumphs hold with store of ladies whose bright eyes reign influence and judge the prize of wit or arms which both contend to win her grace, whom all commend. There let Hymen oft appear. Hymen's the god of marriage, often presented in court masks like his own Comus a mask. Hymen is there uh, mentioned in uh, classical mythology, but oft appear in saffron robe with taper clear and pomp and feast and revelry with mask and antique pageantry. Such sights as youthful poets dream on summer eves by haunted stream. So it moves from a rural scene to a um, urban scene, but the urban scene is a continuation out of the rural scene and in sympathy with it. And then it moves from the, uh, the marriage scene to the, uh, to the stage. And the stage will express a certain type of theater, and the theater is one of comedy, which I'll, I'll look to now here. Such sights as youthful poets dream on summer eves by haunted stream, then to the well-trod stage anon, if Johnson's learned sock be on, or sweet as Shakespeare, fancy's child, warble his native wood notes wild. And ever against eating cares, lap me in soft Lydian airs, married to immortal verse such as the meeting soul may pierce, in notes with many a winding bout, of linked sweetness long drawn out, with wanton heed and giddy cunning, the melting voice through mazes running, untwisting all the chains that tie the hidden soul of harmony, that Orpheus's self may heave his bed from golden slumber on a bed of heaped Elysian flowers and hear such strains as would have won the ear of Pluto to have quite set free his half-regained Eurydice. These delights if thou canst give, mirth with thee I mean to live. So it begins by, uh, by speaking as if from the vantage point of, of mirth, of l'allegro, and concludes with a little distance from that. Uh, the, the poet comes towards it and praises uh, l'allegro and cheerfulness and all the associations with it. And then towards the very end, he pulls back and says, well, actually, hold on a second here. If you can give me all those things, then I will stay with you. And this is what I will be like. If, but it's an if. And then you'll move on to Il Penseroso and look at the other side and say, well, can you give me all those things? And the answer in both cases is neither can deliver all the goods. And yet as a, as a poet of the Reformation, as well as the Renaissance, he is going to want to be a a godly man who represents the whole, uh, the whole of human nature which he's seizing in Christ himself. What does it mean to be a man? You can look to the ancients, but ultimately it's expressed in Christ, the, the, uh, the servant king. Rustic, not acknowledged, and yet the Lord in the midst of others, acting in a certain fashion. But he comes at it from, uh, from a vantage point. Now back to Johnson's sock and Shakespeare's fancy's child. Um, I said it was comedy in the theater of uh, comedy from the ancient Greeks onwards. The actors who dance on stage in both cases, they wear a certain footwear. In the case of comic actors, socks, make no noise. In the tragedy, they have heels and they clop, clop, clop. They make a noise, like goat hooves. Some associate the tragos with uh, the tragedy with the word tragos, a goat, a goat song. But there's a certain noise that makes within a certain rhythm and beat with tragic theater and with the apparel of it, and that's what he's associating here. And Johnson, uh, the most famous playwright of his day, initially, Ben Johnson, 
noted especially for his comedies, Volpone and so forth. And Shakespeare, of course, also known for his comedies, but not only for his comedies. But again, he's noting in, in association with the comedies, his native wood notes wild as again, he, his comedies tend to be set in the natural realm. They're not taking place in cities. In fact, the cities are places where the joy of the comedy is not fully expressed or even contradicted. That's how Midsummer Night's Dream begins. It begins in Athens and then they have to go into the forest because there's uh, uh, strife within the couples that want to be married that Athens is not going to resolve and can't resolve. So they go to nature, the natural realm in the darkness of the forest and there the, the imagination wakes up and resolves what for the, from the vantage point of the city is an irresolvable problem. And out of the uh, possibility of death, which Athens condemns one of the lovers to, they have life instead and marriage that every comedy in Shakespeare concludes with a marriage scene. Every tragedy that Shakespeare has concludes with death and with people being carted away from the stage. Sense of closure in, in either case. Comments or questions, but I went over very quickly. I didn't explain everything and that's not really my purpose here. But a string of associations, oh, just at the end there, Orpheus and so forth, the, 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 the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, Pluto, the god of the underworld, comes up one day, one spring, and sees a beautiful woman in the field, it's Eurydice, and he takes her down, steals her from the realm of light, the realm of day, to be his wife. Uh, unjustly so, but he's a god after all. And uh, Orpheus is a famous singer, so famous that he charms the animals, they follow after him. Um, but also in this case, he goes down to the realm of the dead and brings his wife back with him under one condition. And is that, that's that he doesn't look back at her. If he looks back at her, she'll go back there. And if, it's sort of a bit like Lot and his wife. If you look back, it's, it's done. He can't help but look back. Are you behind me? Are you behind me? I will look, Oop, shoo, gone, back. Um, so uh, he's allowed to bring his wife back to the realm of, of the living under the condition that he no, not look at her. What this means then gets ample commentary from others. What exactly is the poet talking about here? But the story uh, is well known. Milton plays upon it here. But here the Orpheus uh, will gain a Eurydice. She won't be lost to the realm of the underworld, which is how he began the whole poem. Remember? Hence that. Get out of there. I'm not going to be in the underworld. I'm going to be like Orpheus taking my wife bride from the realm of the dead and bring her to the land of the living. And she says, if thou canst give these delights, mirth with thee I mean to live. We're, I'm hitched to you. No more. I don't need, I don't need other, any other considerations. Comments, questions? Yes? I see no precedent in what Milton's doing here in the medievals. Uh, Spencer talks about these same sorts of figures, but I don't think he contrasts them in this way as sees them as contraries. That seems to be Milton's uh, particular invention. As, as I said, with the, you know, the two different, the active life and the political life or the theoretical life, there's already a parallelism going on here in two different ways of doing things. And they are, they are differentiated and to some degree um, at war with one another over supremacy. Socrates says that the phil philosophical life is far superior to the political life because it contemplates the good conflates the eternal. The politician is worried about the here and now, but, but we spend our lives looking at what's good and true and beautiful, and so it's the, it's the much richer life. That's a, that's a contrast to the, the, the Greek way of thinking. Even though we associate with the Greeks because of Socrates, 
it would not have been so before his time. But once he discovers that realm, uh, it leaves an indelible impression on uh, Western thinking, if you will, that there's a different vocation for that realm, which we thereafter call the academia. So the theoretical life gives way, which is associated with philosophers, come the, the, the time of the church, gets associated with theology, but in both cases gets pushed to the academy. Remember, Plato starts the academy says, and is th thereafter associated with the academy. This is why academics are regarded as useless by the world, because they are self-consciously, to some degree, devoted to a thing which is not practical. It's not intended to be. It would distract from that. It's not there to give you a job. It's a hard sell for academics. You know, get to the end of this and we'll give you the great job you've always wanted to be. Well, I mean, I think that there is training for life that happens in university settings, but it's not dedicated to that. And to some degree, it succeeds by not always thinking about the practical utility, by just spending the time which you otherwise would never have to think things through uh, without the, the need to constantly apply it. And where else will you get that? Well, in these days, probably not even academia, but that's the problem with academia. But it's not inherent in academia. Academia tends towards the opposite. But yes, I think it's, I think it's Milton's uh, juxtaposition here. And, and interesting. And as I say, just in my reflection on his character, again, that vocation to be the great epic poet or the great poet for a great nation, which he then puts on hold during the time of Cromwell's government to live a political life. Even though he doesn't think it's his life, he's enough of a Renaissance man to say, uh, I need to consider what's going on around me and apply myself in that context. And he, so he puts aside that until he loses his sight. You can imagine. It's an, it's, I just think it's fascinating on a purely biographical level. Because what must he be thinking? I mean, when he first goes into the office, he probably has no idea how long he's going to be working in it. He certainly doesn't know he's going to lose his sight. And when he does, he must be wondering whether it's all over, especially when the government falls and Charles II comes back. You know, the son who is in exile returns and is Milton's enemy. My vocation as poet, my, my belief that I will be England's great poet, uh, looks like it's done. You're going to hang him. And then he doesn't, of course, but, but still. But here are the preparation. I find it just extraordinary on, on his level, but just think about on, in terms of a personal application. Um, what here, one of the saints of old, or just take a voice of wisdom, if you will, uh, regarded as his strong sense of vocation and yet how he could set it aside. Thinking that uh, if he had truly been called to do this, it would happen eventually, but was willing to wait not which nobody likes, no one. Any other comments or questions? But I, I think Milton, it's not from the medieval period. Although again, the privileging of one over the other in, in the medieval period, which we associate with Christian Europe, it's not that Christian because what do they give the first fruits to? The political life. That's the one who's gonna inherit the state, the, the, uh, the estate of the father passed on through the families. We're not going to give God first. We're going to give ourselves the first fruits. As I say, Luther's father was outraged with him for going into the monastery. All this money, all this time I spent my life gaining wealth and you're going to go to the church. And he's just not just disgusted with him. It's that all my work is going to go. So he's furious with his son as anyone in that age would be. You send your second born into the clergy. Okay, yeah, we'll give a little no you know, a nod to the importance of the contemplative life, but come on. Anyone else?
Bill Panzeroso. We got 15 minutes for Bill Panzeroso. So it begins the same way. And again, note the lineation. You can see it on the page here between a short line, trimeter, and the pentameter, the three beat and the five beat line. Hence, vain deluding joys, the brood of folly without father bread. How little you bested or fill the fixed mind with all your toys. Now this is in response to the cheerful, happy-go-lucky dummy of the political act of life. So he's going to disparage everything that was praised in the previous poem. He's going to absolutely slam it. The brood of folly without father bread. So you don't even have a father. How little you bested or fill the fixed mind with all your toys. Dwell in some idle brain and fancies fond with gaudy shapes possess. As thick and numberless as the gay motes that people light, people the sunbeams, or likest hovering dreams the fickle pensioners of Morpheus's train. Morpheus is uh, the god of dreams. Long before he was in, uh, what's that movie? With... Uh, Morpheus and Neo and so forth, yeah. Remember? Matrix, Matrix yes. So Mor yeah. the god of dreams, that's who Morpheus is. Very appropriate for that movie, right? Because it's the, you know, are you in the Matrix? Are you out of it? Is it what's real? What isn't real? The god of dreams, his name's Morpheus. Fickle pensioners of them. But anyway, back there, you are a realm of make-believe, fancy, And delusion. But hail, thou goddess, sage and holy, hail divinest melancholy, whose saintly visage is too bright to hit the sense of human sight. Okay, so he's not going to hail darkness. That would be satanic. It's not evil be thou my good. He recognizes the negative connotations that are associated with, the, with melancholy, associated with the underworld. It's not the darkness that he's going to praise, it's a light that you can't see, which the contemplative life light does see. It's not the visual light of this world, it's the celestial light, which you cannot see with your eyes, but you can reason with your mind. You can see it in that sense, with the eyes of the mind. Whose saintly visage is too bright to hit the sense of human sight, and therefore, to our weaker view, o'erlaid with black stayed wisdom's hue. Black, but such as in esteem Prince Memnon's sister might beseem, or that starred Ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above the sea nymphs and their powers offended. Yet thou art higher, far descended. Thee, bright haired Vesta, long of yore, to solitary Saturn bore. His daughter she, in Saturn's reign, such mixture was not held as stain. Oft in glimmering bowers and glades he met her, and in secret shades of woody Ida's inmost grove, while yet there was no fear of Jove. So all the associations that have been set up in L'Allegro are being inverted here. You, you've looked at things from the world's perspective but actually there's a, a different way which seems dark to your sight because you're a blind fool. And here's the real path of wisdom. Here's the real path of enlightenment. It's not physical light, it's spiritual light. Come pensive none, devout and pure, sober, steadfast and demure, all in a robe of darkest grain, flowing with majestic train, and sable, stole of Cypri's lawn, or thy decent shoulders drawn. Come, but keep thy wonted state with even step and musing gait and looks commencing with the skies, thy rapt soul sitting in thine eyes. There held in holy passion still, forget thyself to marble till with a sad leaden downward cast thou fix them on the earth as fast and join with thee calm peace and quiet. Spare fast that oft with gods doth diet. And here's the muses in a ring. I round about Jove's altar sing. 
So he hears what? He hears the celestial music, which we can't hear. So it's the life of the mind, the contemplation. It's, it's associating with a, the music of the spheres, which we can't hear. You could hear that music. You dance to it. But there's a better music than that, the music of Mundana. Talked about that already in uh, association with the Nativity Ode. Um, and add to these retired leisure that in Trim Gardens takes his pleasure. But first and chiefest with thee bring him that yawn soars on golden wing, guiding the fiery wheeled throne, the cherub contemplation, and the mute silence hissed along. Less Philomel will deign a song in her sweetest, saddest plight, smoothing the rugged brow of night, while Cynthia checks her dragon yoke gently o'er the accustomed oak. Sweet bird that shunned the noise of folly, mus most musical, most melancholy, thee, chauntress off the woods among, I woo to hear thy even song. And missing thee, I walk unseen on the dry, smooth, shaven green, to behold the wandering moon riding near her highest noon, like, like one had been led astray through the heaven's wide pathless way. And oft, as if her head she bowed, stooping through a fleecy cloud, oft on a plat of rising ground. I missed this. Oh, oh down too far. Plat of rising ground, I hear the oft far off curfew sound over some wide watered shore, swinging slow with sullen roar. Or if the air will not permit, some still removed place will fit, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom, far from all resort of mirth, save the cricket on the hearth, or the bellman's drowsy charm to bless the doors from nightly charm. Harm. So in this case, it's away from the apparent frolicry and festivity of earthly rejoicing. It's the life of retreat. It's the life of solitude. It's the life of, light of contemplation. It's not away from nature, but it is in a sense contemplating upon these things. It, it requires privacy and quiet. You can't be interrupted. If you're trying to think, having somebody speak to you is oppressive. You want to remove yourself for this. Or let my lamp at midnight hour to be seen in some high lonely tower where I may oft outwatch the bear. So he's looking at the heavens now. The great bear, the constellation, uh, associated uh, or regarded by uh, Hermes Trismegistus as a kind of perfection. So the, the constellation of the bear. With uh, thrice great Hermes, or on sphere the spirit of Plato, to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in, his fle in this fleshly nook. Reference to Plato here is his uh, poem devoted, or his uh, dialogue devoted to love, uh, which has temporarily escaped my mind again. It will come to me. Uh, known throughout the medieval period. The not the Phaedrus. Um, not the symposium either. You know what? It's really annoying when this happens. This dialogues were discovered late. Oh, these are all... Timaeus, there you go. The Timaeus, which is on love and it's associated with these uh, great themes of the, the, the heavens as well. Um, and that's what he's thinking about the spirit of Plato here, to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind. So his contemplation, read in the medieval period as a sort of reflection by a pagan poet 
on Christian theology. There's something he had an inkling here because it's, again, it's held together by love. Very influential on the view of cosmology that I've already uh, described here repeatedly. <laughs> uh, the more mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook, referring to the incarnation, and of those demons that are found in fire, air, flood, or underground, whose power hath a true consent with planet or with element. Sometime let gorgeous tragedy and sceptered Paul come sweeping by, presenting Thebes or Pelops line or the tale of Troy divine. I'm going to run out of time if I read the whole thing. I'm going to skip over a significant patch of this and come towards the end. I can do that. But let my due feet never fail to walk the studious cloisters pale. Now, where is this? Walk the studious cloisters pale. 155, thank you. Uh, oh, but it's gone a little bit past. I would have liked to have conceived with the unseen genius of the wood, but let my do feet never fail to walk the studious cloisters pale and love the high embowed, embowed roof with antic pillars massy proof. So now thinking of the con contemplating the, uh, the uh, Greek architecture associated with contemplation again. And storied windows richly dight, casting a dim religious light. Thinking of church life now there, the life of contemplation set up in these grand architectural Things. And there let the pealing organ blow to the full-voiced choir below, in service high and anthems clear, as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes. Now associating the same thing that he did with the Nativity Ode. Associated with silence, not with music, but silence, which is a sweeter sort of music that earthly ears cannot hear and yet is reminded to him by the organ music and the sound of the choirs, which leads him to think about God and not just about the music he's hearing. He's not just, it's, he, more is going on here. And may at last my weary age find out the peaceful hermitage, the hairy gown and mossy cell, that of the uh, hermit's life and the ascetic whipping himself in, the, in that context, beating the body where I may sit and rightly spell of every star that heaven doth show and every herb that sips the dew, till old experience do attain to something like prophetic strain, these pleasures melancholy give. And I with thee will choose to live. But again, at the end, having adopted the perspective or the persona of contemplation, he steps back uh, and, re and it's Mr. Milton now, and he's speaking, if you can give me these things, then I'll be with you, just like he said the other time. I, I skipped over the bit where it, there's a reference to the, uh, the, the theater there, but it's in there somewhere. Same sort of thing. Oh, there it is. With planner, with element, sometime like gorgeous tragedy in sceptered Paul come sweeping by, presenting Thebes or Pelops line or the tale of Troy divine or what, though rare of later age, ennobled hath the buskined stage. With the hip, right? Again, all those associations. So note the Christian associations and yet fused, interfused with classic, with the classical world's uh, forms of literature even in all the associations with it. So again, this, this, and this fusion or integration of Christian thought with classical associations is character, characteristic of all Milton's endeavors. And it becomes uh, ripest in its fullest form in his grand epics. But as I said, with respect to of education, the aim is transformation is to take the classical forms and repurpose them as they are intended to be used to the service of God. And he's not going to, as is apparent from his address to both L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, as much as he draws near to them, he then draws back and says, effectively, I'll be with you if you can give me all these things, and neither can. Right, so he's going to see the, the mer merits and virtues of both of each and of both.
and the combination will then lead him forward in the same way in that his uh, work of education will command him both to a practical life as well as a contemplative life. And there, that one man is, that is able to combine those two is going to be uh, what is in view here. Uh, comments or questions? Sorry, I abruptly ended here. Okay.